ओके 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 वी आर लाइव एंड लेट्स वेट फॉर सम पीपल टू जॉइन इन एंड देन वी शेल स्टार्ट ओके पीपल हैव स्टार्टेड टू जॉइन हाई एवरी वन वेलकम टू कारवान and uh, we will start in a few moments my name is ishan sharma and i am the founder of carwan the heritage exploration initiative this is our instagram handle at carwan heritage if you are new to this handle please do follow the page uh, we bring some great posts on history great content and also some great interactions and conversations i am waiting for my guest to join in and then we'll do a formal introduction of sorts and also i'll introduce a wonderful book which i think is revolutionary in its own rights and uh, it's going to be a game changer in the way we kind of study the past thank you so much anjali ji for your very kind comment thank you so much we really appreciate that Okay, let me send my uh, guest this. Okay, I think he's here. And uh, I seek your forgiveness in advance. Hi, hi, Anirudh. Welcome. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Yeah. I think there's some internet issue. There's some uh, lag in your video, but I think that's uh, that's nothing to be worried about. But uh, okay. welcome, welcome to this uh, session. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this, and uh, let's get to it. But as I was saying, I I must seek uh, all of your forgiveness in advance because there might be some sloganing in my background because it's the election season uh, from where I'm connecting right now. So. that is why it's it's uttar pradesh so uh, you know people are all uh, in 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 josh so <laughs> and we are talking we are going to talk about a wonderful book which uh, jiske liye mujhe bahut uh, josh hai uh, and this book is called lords of the deccan southern india from the chalukyas to the cholas i'll show, show you the cover of this book once and for me this book uh, is kind of a game changer in the way we study the past being a, a professional history student i must say this has changed at least try to change our perspective of how we used to see indian past especially about the southern india and i must i must congratulate anirudh for this wonderful book let me also just introduce you to our audience i'll read out the formal introduction in the book itself so anirudh kanisethi our guest today is a history researcher and writer based out of bengaluru and hyderabad and i think he's currently in hyderabad if i'm not wrong he has received yes, grants sir. from the princeton princeton center for digital humanities and the india foundation for the arts and his writings and works have featured in the hindu the indian express live mint and so many international and national publications and also we all have heard his podcast echoes from india and yuddha uh, and we all are fans of his podcast and i think uh, that also has reflected in this book somehow in the narrative style of the book so let me ask you that that question in, uh, as the, as my first question you know it's very difficult for a researcher to write a narrative non fiction like this and before this i think on deck there was only one book by manu pillai uh, that was of course uh, it's it's after what you have written post this right. period and uh, so how how was that kind of your experience of writing such narrative non fiction so i firmly believe that history i mean how do i put this if you look at most of the media masquerading as historical out there if you look at stuff on ott platforms or even if you look at i would say a good 60s to 70s even not more than that uh, percent of um, the 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 instagram handles that are purportedly about in history um or even the youtube channels that cover indian history 
there's a tendency to almost masalify uh, history in order to like make it more interesting and palatable right there's all these anachronistic ideas of what people are going to find interesting coupled with a heavy dose of uh, misinformation and sometimes even conspiracy theories um because it almost seems like people don't think that history can be interesting in its own right uh, it's like history must must have some kind of modern idea in order for it to be engaging um i am firmly convinced that that is not the case at all because history is really a story of uh, how our world came to be our world shaped by people who have the same fundamental human impulses as you and me um therefore a really good historical tale should be able to um grab you and keep you interested by virtue of it it being populated by realistic and believable people um reacting to things that are sometimes at their control and sometimes totally out of their control right um it's not a linear process it's not that glorious king a does this thing which which is continued by glorious king b and so on so forth until you know and until not so glorious king d uh it, it does something that's very immoral and so on which leads to the collapse of the empire and that's how history was written um through much of the 20th century and we've kind of like, we need to move beyond that in in at least in the telling of indian history to general audiences um if you look at for example the works of william dalrymple um i would actually say that one of my most important influences was reading white mughals uh, when i was probably around your age ishan um and it was so interesting to me because white mughals is a story of people it's 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 people who are who are falling in love and who are pushing against these structures that are you know very very brittle and don't really fully understand them and still try to find some happiness in the center of all that and that is what makes it so fascinating the the historical setting in itself is interesting especially the way that it's is kind of uh, woven into the narrative for fundamentally what makes white mughals work is that it's a story of people um and that was really the logic uh, of writing my book this way is that i wanted to make it very clear that the rulers of the medieval deccan are not some obscure unimaginable uninteresting characters um but that they are living breathing human beings um who had the same kind of um capacity for um ambition and wonder and creativity as well as the same capacity for cruelty and avarice as you and me and to try and tell that story in an interesting and compelling way um using the narrative to um give you a sense of the lives and times of these remarkable people was really the main objective of the book and that's why it's it's narrative is it's i tried to make it as conversational as possible you know i very often break the fourth wall and say so this is why we're talking about this particular thing and this is why you should stay with me as i'm going on this apparent tangent because as you'll see that it's really related very closely to the narrative that you and i have been following and enjoying so far um and that's something that i, I that's how i believe personally that history needs to be written it shouldn't be about someone sitting necessarily in in an ivory tower uh declaiming to the masses how they should be thinking about a particular historical event but rather really taking them on this journey not just of a, a narrative of people's lives but also along the journey of historiography as well why is it that we use particular kinds of evidence to tell historical stories how do we interpret this evidence um and that that's that i try to make it as interesting as possible because of course damn it is is literally detective work that we do as history writers uh, and i wanted to make sure that whoever reads the book kind of enjoys and appreciates that that's very that's very uh, true because uh, when we do our postings and we do we also research we come across so many uh, quote and quote you know that uh, controversial he see this was happening at that time muslims were ruling and they were doing this to the hindus and that kind of narrative of history and they are getting millions of views on their videos without any factual uh, you know backing but it was so nice to see that a book could could be written at least and uh, with sources like daud ali and uh, you know r champak lakshmi sheldon pollock and uh, malini adiga whose whose work is amazing Uh, not very yeah. well known but that and uh, yeah so uh, you know turning transforming an academic paper like of daud ali like of malini adiga into a narrative style is of course a very uh, difficult task could uh, task to do so was it helpful because you were also leading uh, a podcast where you 
use this kind of narrative style in your podcast so was that experience really helped you in writing this book yeah i would i would say definitely because i think what podcasting has always pushed me to do is to try and think about there's there's all this all this potential that the audio format unlocks which you don't have simply with the word, written word so for mm-hmm. example podcast if i say drums were beating and horns were blowing um i can literally put in the sound effects and make it that much more compelling and once i begin to think about okay so how do i actually use sensory information in trying to tell a story um then it unlocks like new potential layers in which i can use uh, that i can use to grab people's attention um and if you read the introduction of the book and a lot of people have told me they really like the way i conclude the introduction where i say that um i've spoken for too long now can you hear a, a great drum beating in the distance um and i feel like that's something that i i would only have written if i was a, since i am a podcaster because i'm used to grabbing people's attention with sound and now with the written word i know that there are certain um senses that i can like tap into to make them all the more interested because instead of saying okay so this thing happened and then that thing happened and that thing happened which tends to be a lot of you know very dry history writing that that is still a thing in india today if i say okay this was happening and this is what it might have sounded like this would have been the colors these would have been the scents um all of a sudden you know you you just grab people's attention in a way that just a dry framework of things happening is just not going to be able to do um because you you suddenly tap into all these layers in their imagination um if if you say that there there there's, there was perfume in the air you know people are going to imagine oh, wow okay perfume interesting or if you say that you know tr- trumpets were blowing you know people were screaming elephants were trumpeting people know all these sounds and once you like actually weave them organically into the narrative itself um you can make it like way more compelling by tapping into these other memories they have right that's what really is the hallmark of good fiction writing what what a really good fiction writer does is that they transport you utterly and completely into the world that they're creating um and that's something that i think is very useful to a history writer because um you want to comp- you want to compellingly bring people into the world that you're creating and make it clear to them that this is not just some dry and boring place uh, you want to make it clear to them that it's a place that was as as full and packed with sound and color and heat as every moment of our lives um and be coming at it from a pod- podcasting background where i've been doing this through audio allowed me to kind of bring some of the learnings of what worked there into the book as well um one thing that um, people always tell me is that you know the very first episode of my podcast where i'm talking about alexander's invasion of india i describe the last stand of, of uh, king porus against against the greek army um there's a section where i i say that his bodyguards all stood together and they blew conch shells you know because conch shells is something that we knew that medieval like so ancient indians used on battlefields but it's not a sound you'll very often hear on in podcasts um and one person i still remember told me that he was cutting vegetables when he was listening to that podcast and when he heard the corn shell sound he almost cut his finger because it's just a, such a unique little indian sound it told it when it it actually like almost it almost feels like you're hearing something that actually happened um and so like all those little details right you know like let's talk about your sounds of i don't know people's skulls being squelched under the uh, feet of rampaging elephants uh let us talk about the the snapping of flags in the breeze because all these things we know must have happened um but if if we stick to you know the very limited primary sources that we have as history writers um because those aren't going to describe all these things in such vividness and detail you know if we they'll just say oh this battle happened and this glorious king won and that glorious king was defeated but like you got to like allow your your imagination to take you there and allow and also kind of use your imagination to bring the readers into your world and that was very much the the approach that i tried to take through the book i think you have succeeded in that uh, kind of taking that approach uh, because it's not very easy and it it doesn't come naturally to most of the writers especially historians because uh, there's this sense of dryness in these uh, Oh, you know uh, experienced historians uh, who who are very much into academic writing and that is why there's this disconnect with, with the public of academic mm-hmm. writing then such such initiatives like these books and podcasts can actually rebuild that 
dialogues of the past in a very innovative sense and which is happening through this book through manu's book through all young writers like ira also has written some good books so i think that's that's something that your generation of historians are going to change for us for many generations to come and for also the senior historians who are going to read these books they might also think you know why why didn't we think of this earlier of making because it's high time that we make history accessible to the public considering the fact that how the narrative is being driven uh, in in the wrong direction it's very important to bring it back and that brings me to the question uh, because my research interest is always not in the empires not how they not the interregional uh, you know relations what's what's in this book but most importantly the historiography mm-hmm. and uh, that brings me to the question because in the in introduction itself i think it was the fourth or fifth page of something where you mentioned how we see what is our perception of history uh, which mm-hmm. is you know the the european kind of uh, a lens so would you like to tell us about that uh, and how did this book try to change that perception of history that's a very interesting question i think that one thing that most of us especially those of us who haven't like formally studied history it's not something that we necessarily like, think about very deeply um and i think that there's a very profound eurocentrism in the way that we think about how history should play out we think that history in the ideal sense must be exactly like how things happen in europe um it must be that the, you have you know these these great powerful international seafaring empires um that you have you know fleets of ships and powerful merchants and bankers uh, and that is how that is how history must have been and why was it that india was not like that um people ask me for example why was it that you know indian kingdoms didn't have didn't use sea power why is it that you don't see indians going and colonizing the british isles uh, why is it that indians weren't using maps uh, why was why is it that indians are not keeping these detailed administrative records why is and, and there's there's all these questions which only come i think from thinking that europe is the default and that european history dictates how all of global history must have been um and the, uh, that's kind of like compounded by the fact that now chinese historians and chinese history is is becoming is is coming to center stage as as it rightfully should china, china was through much of the pre, much of pre modern history one of the greatest uh, economic centers of the world so it is good to see china finally getting that kind of appreciation from scholarship but the thing is that china especially ancient china and ancient europe at, at least especially roman europe are quite similar in the sense that or at least superficially similar in the sense that you will have an emperor and you'll have a bureaucracy and you'll have you know a central administration taxes um all that stuff that's happening or or like from an imperial capital and because we think that because these these two great pre-modern empires were doing that then all of his all kingdoms everywhere in the world must have been exactly the same way um if you look at a lot of nationalist historiography of of ancient and medieval india you'll see them you know just going just going i mean i still remember when i was reading about um, the chalukyas of vatapi um and there's a little section which describes how pulikeshi the second um f- goes and conquers uh, the the island of puri uh, which is near modern mumbai and what the epigraphical source says is that you know um his, his boats cut across it you know like rotting elephants and that he managed to get his troops there you know from from the shore to the island the way that this was interpreted by the historian uh, durga prasad dikshit was that this must have been achieved by the chalukya imperial navy but there is no sign in any other source or even even in this source that the chalukyas had a navy all that pulikeshi is saying is they had boats he could have hired those boats from fishermen from merchants why is it that we assume that you know if ancient rome must have had a navy and some dynasties in ancient china had a navy therefore indian polities must have also had a navy uh, and this this let's just actually feeds into like almost every aspect of medieval india right when when you think about a merchant organization like the aimu river the, the 500 lords of ayavali um who i mean sorry give me one second so those who are watching us can uh, drop in their questions in the chat uh, not in the chat but there's this question uh, feature on instagram live you can all 
drop your questions and we'll we'll pick them up in the end yeah anil you were saying um so yes the five hundred lords of ayavali now the the recent tendency has been to try and interpret them as a analog to the east india company um in fact i mean i've actually written of them in that sense in some of my public writing because make it more interesting and engaging but the reality of it is that we have no idea how these guys organize themselves how was it that this organization and the first mention we have them is from 600 so 700 ad or so and the last is from around 1600 so it's an organization that was around in various forms for nearly 1000 years but we don't know how it's actually organized the primary sources don't allow us to make that conclusion now rather than trying to fit them into this eurocentric model that oh they must have been like the east india company um you're actually when when you try to make this assumption you're actually closing yourself off to potentially new and much more exciting interpretation of the sources when you try to interpret as a pre modern indian empire as just being oh this was basically ancient rome but in india or basically ancient china but in india then once again you're closing yourself off to all these exciting potentials because what the inscriptions actually reveal once you get rid of this need to make everything seem like europe and allow things to stand on their own terms as the primary sources reveal them um then the sense that you get is that ancient india had this totally unique form of a polity uh, what ronald indian calls the imperial formation on the imperial network where you essentially have these a few dynasties that emerge in like very geopolitically powerful and crucial centers which then seek to incorporate other geopolitical centers into their um, into their network uh, through a variety of very interesting means uh, including war uh including temple building and including various forms of literary power and that's something i try to give a lot of attention to in my book right that's why i spend so much time talking about all these unique little things because once you get at this idea that, oh there must have been a bureaucracy there must have been an imperial navy this that this that this that you begin to glimpse these as like much more unique and fascinating buildings uh sorry fascinating institutions the the in the pre the pre modern indian empire is a totally unique institution There's nothing else like it anywhere in the else in the world it's capable of doing the same things as a, as a ancient rome or an ancient china in terms of mobilizing immense amounts of manpower undertaking extraordinary architectural projects um you know generating in enormous amounts of like cultural output but it's doing this using a totally different kind of organization structure than anything we see anywhere else in the world and as you begin to appreciate that um you begin to realize that hi- human history is not a linear thing it didn't have to be that uh things have to turn out only in one particular way because you you check these 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 boxes you know you unlock these 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 technologies and then you're a successful empire there is no formula for historical success the same kind of outcomes can be achieved through a variety of organizational forms and if you think about it that 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 fundamental principle of 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 uh, that there isn't a single fixed formula actually really applies to almost anything that we see not just in human history but in natural history as well um you will see again and again over time that different kinds of biological organisms with different with similar body plans evolve to fill into particular kind of ecological niches and these can happen totally independently they can fulfill the same kind of ecological niche with a with very different or very similar kinds of body plans and the same applies also to i think human history as well is that you don't have to have a single blueprint of what a polity must look like in order for it to achieve the same things um and to actually understand and appreciate this uniqueness gives you a much grander sense of what history is really about uh, than these stale kind of cookie cutter templates um that oh this king was very virtuous therefore his empire was successful or this king was very smart and he won a lot of wars therefore his empire was very centralized come on that's not how people work today we can see that people are complex that they are always responding to and trying to take advantage of or being overcome by forces that are around them and it's about time that we try and bring that uniqueness that 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 constant flux and change uh, to our understanding of the past as well yes that eurocentric approach yes that should be changed but you know there's uh, when you were talking about these uh, uh similarities or you know th- this tendency to uh to 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 find parallels in europe and in india i think there's this one parallel which was drawn by uh, richard eaton and uh, philip wagner and that was the case of ramaraya 
you know taking sovereignty by taking titles of the chalukyan kings like sharmel uh, sharlan uh, did for the it was i think he took for the northern europe uh, the, the roman pillars from italy and mm-hmm. they drew this parallel between the two so how do you see this sense of so- sovereignty this ideals of sovereignty in european history and in indian history especially the deccan because we are talking about the deccan today that's an interesting question and i would say that it seems to be much more of a human thing than a european thing or an indian thing you know to try and draw a connection to some kind of legendary past which therefore exalts you and makes you superior and better and different from other political contenders and therefore gives you a right to enforce your political authority um we can actually see that very well in indian politics today right uh, the way that political parties draw legitimacy from various historical figures claiming to be connected to them and of course the historical figures can't exactly rise up out of the grave and shake their bony hands at them and say no this is not we not what we used to stand for right um it's it's very easy to try and you know take these silent monuments and make them tell a tale that that you are able to decide through your media apparatus and this applies not just to modern indian politics but also very well to medieval indian politics um vijayanagara and not just vijayanagara also bijapur is a great example um because you will see that they take these elements of chalukya architecture and or they will take chalukya inscriptions and they will just incorporate them into the gateways as though you know these 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 empo these empress from 500 years ago are endorsing us you know therefore you know we are we are qualified to rule over you that kind of thing um and we went we you you gave an example of charlemagne uh, we talked about bijapur we talked about vijayanagara but um, this is very interesting example that uh, again that eton and wagner provide in their uh, in their book palmini architecture which which i think i actually mentioned in my book um, of the arvattu khambada mosque in uh, bankapura and um, this mosque was basically it's it is originally a temple uh, and it was converted to a mosque but not in the way that we generally think about right the, the way that it's kind of like portrayed uh, today in in our political discourse is that this is all this all absolute iconoclasm and it came from from absolute bigotry and hatred and so on but if you take the example of the ottoman sultans right um when they take over constantinople uh, current day istanbul uh, and they take over the magnificent uh, church of saint sophia and they make it into the hagia sophia mosque they keep it basically as it was they don't actually change that they just add a little mihrab over there and tada it's done it's a mosque now um and to the, to the they they adopt the imperial culture of their predecessors the eastern roman empire to the point where there is a very famous inscription of suleiman the magnificent where he says that um and then this again I, i think ties to the overall point of like seeking legitimacy from the past he says that um in egypt in cairo i am the sultan so drawing legitimacy from the the mamluk sultans used to rule there in baghdad i am the caliph so drawing legitimacy from the abbasid caliphs used to rule there and then finally and in 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 istanbul i am the kaiser so once again the caesar you know the eastern roman emperor so you can see how he is directly connecting himself to the past that way and from that sense the hagia sophia mosque is not some i mean again of course modern turk nationalists including of course uh, president erdogan might disagree with this assessment but that doesn't mean that that, that doesn't mean that that is that, that is actually factually based but if the the way that the ottomans actually saw themselves was as the successors of the roman empire and the same applies to the way that the bijapuris took over the arabattu khambada mosque because it was it wasn't really defaced in any like meaningful sense they just added a couple of like additional gateways and they removed the idol and basically converted it wholesale into a mosque rather than seeing this as some kind of act of like horrific iconoclasm why do we not see it as a new kind of polity in that region which would have had people who had been native to the region for centuries just professing a new religion um trying to relate themselves and show respect to the remnants of what they what used what what used to be there and to say that this is how we used to be and this is us in a new modern updated form connected to a new global cosmopolitan religion um why do we i don't i don't i really don't understand the modern need to kind of make it into us versus them or um this inferiority versus that superiority and more importantly to say that oh this thing happened 500 years ago therefore we must do 
this this violence and this this bigotry today that just doesn't make any sense especially when there isn't any sign of that kind of bigotry happening in the past instead what we see is this much more deep seated human urge to pay respect to the past and claim legitimacy from what happened in the past and uh, yes that's that's very true and that's uh, as you were saying about that uh, perception of the past another aspect of this perception that came to my mind was the erasure of deccan from the mainstream history that uh, consciously or unconsciously uh, was result of this whole uh, scholarship uh, of so many years and uh, how do you see this because our history uh, unfortunately has been largely that gangetic plain focused northern uh, northern centric um, history so how do you see that erasure impacted on our collective consciousness of of this nation and our understanding of the past especially in indian context i would say that the result of like not paying attention to one region's history in pursuit of these unitary overarching narratives is that we actually end up impoverishing ourselves we actually end up creating a past that is much smaller and much less diverse and frankly much less interesting than the reality of what happened because we can see today that we live in a extraordinarily multicultural world i was looking at a telugu news program earlier today about how a new korean restaurant has like opened up in the small town andhra pradesh and you know, people are just like going are just flocking to it uh, because they've heard they've been watching k dramas and they're enjoying it um and this we also you know we wear most of us wear jeans you know which are basically minus pants invented in the 19th century in california and are now like a global cultural phenomenon um we are so used to our world being full of all these rich influences from all over the place and we take pride in it you know it's it's a matter of personal pride to be globalized to be taking part in all these like trans regional uh, uh, interactions and yet when it comes to india's history we only want the unitary ones we only want to think that oh this region was totally pure and this region was totally pure and no influence came from outside to here in fact we were the ones influencing everyone and we were the ones you know we were the ones who were leading the world by example now i feel like this actually like i said it not only empowers us but also reveals i think a bit of insecurity uh, which we should have grown beyond as a nation by this point because you can still understand why in the 19th and 20th centuries we would want to say that no you know we were actually great we were not these barbarians that the british make us out to be we are not this is this backwater of the world we were involved we 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 were we were very brilliant and we were these amazing and glorious things fine i'm going to hang over in the 21st century um we know very well that we achieved very remarkable things that we had all these remarkable qualities what is holding us back from acknowledging that there were many such qualities across the indian subcontinent really acknowledging and trying to understand all the a complex and innovative ways in which they impacted each other you know who's talking about the fact that the medieval deccan and kashmir had this intense intellectual and religious relationship where you have a lot of kashmiri um, poets and a lot of kashmiri uh, writers who are moving from uh, from there to the deccan and working in deccan courts uh, you have uh, evidence of them you know commissioning temples you know becoming generals of these things and you also have evidence of like people from uh, the gangetic plains who are coming down to uh, the chola court and who are writing ex- like extraordinary agama texts you know these ritual texts um, describing how you prepare for chariot festivals all these things um how can you strip them of the of the room that they deserve in our history just because we want to prove that xyz arbitrarily chosen region was the most superior xyz arbitrarily chosen religion or culture or language was the most superior when that's not the way that medieval people saw themselves if medieval people took pride in their uh, international connections if they took pride in the fact that they were able to attract talent from so many places if they took pride in the fact that they were able to travel and see so many different parts of the world why is it that we are somehow insecure and cannot admit that and in a need to instead shoehorn this anachronistic idea of purity onto them why not acknowledge and take pride in the fact that they were as multicultural and as proud of it as we are today why not recognize the same human impulses of our world in the medieval world as well 
very true and uh, something that we must really understand uh, at this you know point of time and uh, some of us must be wondering that what is this deccan so can you call, can you it's the most fundamental question of my set so can you tell us the meaning of deccan and also not just the word deccan because i think the word itself came from dakhni which was one of the earliest forms of urdu but in terms of geography in terms of political imagination and also the cultural understandings of this region the word dakhni is actually much older than dakhni um it actually comes from the the term dakshina uh which uh, the, the sanskrit term dakshina which in in pali and prakrit would be dakhina meaning south uh, that's actually where the term comes from um and um, we have we have evidence of like as early as the um first century bc or ce that this was the internationally accepted term for it because we have um greek writers calling it uh, dakhina badis um so we do know that you know the 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 term deccan itself is actually very old now there are multiple ways to think about it. you can think of the deccan as being um as being purely a, a a geological concept the deccan plateau is this is this vast plateau that was created uh, owing to volcanic activity about 65 million years ago when when the indian subcontinent still moving towards asia to to form the himalayas um but it also like emerges as as a kind of geocultural zone um especially through the early medieval period which is which is why i decided to write about it because that's really when the deccan begins to see what 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 we could call an imperial formation uh, where you have one kind of overarching uh, political hierarchy that incorporates dozens hundreds thousands perhaps of like power centers um and really is acknowledged as a superpower by much of the world um but what really defines this region i mean it's kind of it's kind of difficult to give you a single answer to that um, i would say the, the there are multiple kind of core regions in the deccan where you see really mighty polities um there is there is one core region of course in the malaprabha river valley in northern karnataka there is there there's another kind of core region towards the southern part of the deccan plateau where kind of transitions into uh, the scraton and then into these hills leading into tamil country um and of course you have the western ghats which uh, which bind which bounded on one side and shape the agricultural practices because a lot of the rain that comes in through the monsoons um needs to fall on this side of the western ghats which means that the interior of the deccan is actually usually fairly dry and as a result of that you always see this inland deccan empires going and trying to conquer the coast um and but most importantly i think really the the heartland of the deccan um and one of the great heartlands of south asian history and like totally neglected is the great basin of the godavari and krishna rivers um the godavari river is actually i was actually amazed to see how vast the thing is considering how little it's talked about in in indian history the godavari river basin is third in size to the indus basin and the gangetic river basin it's huge it's absolutely huge um and it given its size you you would obviously expect that a riverine system of that kind of size would obviously have seen very ambitious and very powerful polities and once you really begin to understand the geography of the deccan how how on one side is bound by the by these mountains um and how it has these 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 rain fed rivers flowing through it then you begin to get a better sense of like why is it that deccan history has these ebbs and flows why is it that empires tend to emerge in one particular part of the deccan then emerge and try to assimilate these other regions why is it that you see um, when these great empires kind of fade away these smaller regionally focused polities emerging you always tend to see that there will be one in south karnataka there will be one in uh, northern maharashtra and there will be one in telangana you see that in the sayana yadavas the kakatiyas and the hoysalas uh, you see that uh, with ahmednagar the the kutub shahi kingdom and of course vijayanagara and like it is so interesting to, to see that that same pattern like consistently keeps repeating itself again and again um, almost like a rhythm or or as people who listen to my podcast might call it almost like an echo um, because that underlying geography and geopolitics of this region drives so much of what evolves from it and what tends to happen in it and how it interacts with the other geopolitical regions of the subcontinent 
<laughs> definitely uh, so uh, before my last question for this conversations about 40 45 minutes of our great conversation and introduction of sorts to the book that we are discussing i'll just show the cover again for those uh, okay so second last question i have a question for the cover as well so this is the cover beautiful cover uh, very well designed uh, cover so uh, tell me the story behind this cover it's it's quite uh, <laughs> it's it's a it's a crown but it's wonderful thank you um so what we what what i really wanted to make sure uh, with the cover was that it has to make it clear that these were people that these are not some obscure unimaginable figures who who and all that they left behind were these uh, temples and these uh, and these sculptures because you search for any book about the chalukyas or any medieval polity the cover is always always going to be a temple and unless you actually understand and appreciate temple architecture which which a lot of us like haven't really been trained to do you're just going to be like oh yeah boring temple man you are move on you know what this book isn't interesting to me i wanted to make sure that we had something unique different uh, and something that really caught the eye and um, there was this whole thing you know and my when my publishers and i were trying to figure out what would have been the best idea what they were, they, they were they were sending me interesting sculptures interesting temples and i was like no no it's I, these are nice pictures but they're not going to work they're, they're not going to stand out enough that's what everybody else is doing um they, then they finally found this very interesting mural from the badami caves or i think it was ajanta actually um which shows a king in in a, in a courtly scene you know receiving uh, receiving supplicants and it's it it looked i mean it looked interesting uh, and it was definitely different from the other covers that were out there of of books but it was also i mean it was it was it was a mural that wasn't in very good condition it was all flaking off and like i was a little concerned that it won't be interesting so i said give me a day and like let me see if i can find alternative ideas um i happened to stumble across this illustrated this beautiful illustration of a crown like a black and white line illustration um in this uh, in this book called the architecture of the manasara which is um which is a medieval deccan text um and like it describes various categories of crowns and what the authors have done is actually found um as an example of a sculpture that fit this description and they had it illustrated so like wait this isn't black and white what if we can get somebody to like actually make a realistic drawing of what this could look like um i put up a call on instagram and like a whole bunch of like young artists got in touch but um i was applying to every single one of them um all of them had like a different kind of style it wasn't exactly what i was looking for uh, until until this guy called shaz shake i don't know if shaz is here but shaz happened to like randomly like text me and uh he didn't have anything on his profile so i wasn't sure what his art style was like uh, but he said that his friend could do something like this and i said okay dude like i can't i can't actually promise you guys payment until my publisher agrees that they will fund this but can you send me a mock up anyway and he said normally we don't do it you know we don't we don't like undertake commissions without being paid but we're willing to give you a chance because a friend of ours is a fan of your echoes of india podcast so i was like okay okay man that's amazing thank you please do it and so they did and i was blown away because even the very first draft they those guys immediately understood exactly what i wanted and they made something that looked very realistic and i was like bloody hell we have to do this i sent this to my editor parth that jagannath and he was like oh my god this is amazing <laughs> i'm going to write these guys a check right now just make them do it uh, and so i worked with them for like a week or so and um, uh, made sure that we got all those little details right you know the kirti mukha those those line like faces you know the makaras uh, the, the elephant tongues and all that um and i also told them very clearly that look don't make it look like a nice glorious shiny new crown i want it to look worn um but also well maintained and like they somehow i mean it was a very broad general direction but those guys nailed it because the crown that you see there it looks like a family heirloom it looks like something that's been passed on for a century or so it's got all these scratches and all that but the jewels are as shiny and as polished and the pearls are all polished as beautifully as it would have been the day the crown was made and it gives you a sense of of an actual historical artifact which has been passed down from uh, generation to generation and contains within it all these stories um and that's exactly what i wanted to achieve with the cover was to expose to show to people that you know there aren't a lot of artifacts that survive from this period that's why we had to illustrate it but these are the kinds of 
living breathing people and living breathing artifacts that you can expect to explore through this book um, and to especially to like there's a tendency to really think that all ancient indians wore these wore these ridiculous cartoon crowns that you see in amar chitra katha or in doordarshan you know, where these these they're like 6 feet tall and they have this huge disc behind them for no apparent reason but we have so much evidence from sculpture of what these people actually looked like you know the kind of jewelry they wore the kind of crowns they wore and i wanted to give a sense of that that reality and and a little bit of the grit uh, of their lives uh, through the illustration that we chose and i think nakshatra and shahs uh, are the artists who did this you know, absolutely knocked out of the park no doubt no doubt in that and you know there are so many questions regarding uh, the use of literature the use of research and how the 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 the, the balance that you made in this book but uh that will keep for the second session that we are planning uh the date will be finalized but for those who are listening to us because this book deserves so much more uh, we have decided that we are inviting anil to deliver the carvan special lecture on our platform on our youtube channel uh, at the end of this month uh the dates will be released uh, by 15th or 16th on our instagram handle that you can follow but uh in the book uh, when you talk about the build, the temple buildings uh you focus more on the political aspect of uh, you know this whole activity that was undertook by the refunded by the rulers but somehow in some places you kind of uh, do not put much focus on the, uh, the the devotional aspect because if we see logically the kings would have uh, appreciated the political reasons but they would have not funded this much in something that they didn't believe in so did you think uh, that this spiritual aspect or the devotional aspect is already well known and political reasons is something that must be understood by the masses that that was partially the reason because the way we think about kings today is that they were all sanskari individuals and all of them wanted to do nothing more in their lives and go and fight a battle and build a temple and they would die happily but i mean look at politicians today and i actually do dispute what you're saying ishan about them having to be devout in order to like spend this much money because how many politicians do you think are actually devout to spend so much money on on building the monuments that they build you know uh, in fact we actually have some medieval sources which actually say this quite explicitly there's this a very interesting verse from uh, um, bilhana's uh, vikramanka devacharitam where he says explicitly that there are a lot of kings who 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 laugh internally in their hearts thinking this is all nonsense and then build all these extraordinary shrines to vishnu and shiva so i mean if medieval people are telling you that kings are full of shit then you should probably listen to them this is my logic right um and yeah i mean it is difficult to say what these kings generally believe because of course in all their inscriptions they will they will claim to be you know the greatest and most devout servant of god who ever walked on the earth and you know the most humble and down to earth people while also you know boasting about you know how many countries they conquered how rich they are and how many women especially they were abducted through war and all that um, but i will leave the hypocrisy aside because that is that is really worthy of a whole other rant in of itself um we don't know how these people actually saw these buildings that they were investing in what we can surmise is that if they were spending this much money on a building if they were investing so much in bringing together the priests and the architects and the sculptors and the logisticians and you know the blacksmiths and the cooks and the laborers to build something like this that they were probably getting something out of it as well um and sure a part of it may have been their own kind of spiritual beliefs their their own um, you know their own spiritual satisfaction but i think that a much a much larger portion of that would have been sheer political pragmatism because if you if you get a, if you read medieval literature you will see that there isn't a lot of room for a king to make any mistakes you need to the king needed to have all his resources all his wits about him at all times otherwise he was going to be assassinated conquered and put to death in any number of horrible and brutal ways now why would a king who is living such a precarious existence have plowed so much money into a project like this because it's getting him benefits it establishes him uh, in a certain kind of uh, immaterial way uh, it gives him a certain kind of prestige which uh, which which, uh, which other kings simply cannot compete with that is why they are spending that much money on it now i'm not saying this would have been the case for every single king uh, but that's kind of precisely the point of, of that of, of my overall argument which is that 
the motivations of medieval people are as complex and multidimensional and and probably even messy as your motivation is mine the reason why we spend time and effort and resources on uh, on anything can come from a multitude of different reasons not just from uh, religious you know from from religious devotion or not just from you know wanting to prove that we're better than people we might have a whole bunch of potential reasons for doing that and understanding and appreciating that complexity uh, the 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 humanity of the people who are doing these things was something i very much wanted to bring across um, i really really wanted to emphasize that and make them more than these two dimensional nationalist caricatures that they have unfortunately uh, been reduced to of late thank you so much for that clarification and i think we have a question from somebody in the audience the ninja 047 he says that or she says that describing the soldier you say that they had bare chest and dhoti so why was uh, there was a lack of armors and everything that's a good question um the reason why we are able to say that most soldiers had that is because of hero stones right hero stones give you a very clear sense of what how these people actually looked how they actually fought um in terms of armor and how much was being produced and who was wearing it I'm fairly certain it was being produced. There's actually one bit in my book where I describe, for example, the Chalukya king Vikramaditya the first, where he says that um, I have, I possess, possess, I possess armor into which uh, many, many, many swords have been driven. Right. So clearly, some people were wearing armor, but I'm, I'm guessing, given the kind of metallurgical knowledge, given the kind of craftsmanship that is required to produce a suit of armor, it was mostly only the elites who were actually wearing it. the vast majority of people who were actually fighting the battles and dying on the front lines would have been you know basically you know your your lads from such and such village uh, who have a little off time you know now now, now waiting for the crops to grow uh, and another way for them to like get a little bit of income for their families is to go and fight in these battles um, and those guys would have had like i don't know maybe like one spear that their great grandfather happened to you know uh loot off some cop somewhere or perhaps got the local blacksmith to commission and they've been using that for generations and generations so they would have had maybe a shield maybe a sword maybe a spear um but aside from that they probably would not have been able to afford armor and so on uh, perhaps as they rose up to the ranks they would have been able to but unless they were attached to some kind of royal household um and like actually had that resource it's very unlikely that most people had armor and that also lines up with what we know from the rest of the world as well right if you look at medieval european armies barely anybody wore armor there's a stereotype because all the movies and tv shows produced about medieval europe are about the kings that everybody is wearing like full plate armor but that would of course more than what a peasant earned in a lifetime in medieval europe um so the vast majority of people on the battlefields i think probably would not have been armored and probably would have um preferred clothing that was very light and and didn't obstruct them allowed them to fight freely uh, which is very much what the hero stones tell us they were just wearing dhotis and a shield and a weapon and that was just about it and i so hope that this book uh, gets translated into hindi and other languages uh, so that people can know so much more about the things that you are mentioning here for those who are not english readers but you know this this so you know uh, at the end i i can only say that this book is going to be a game changer uh, that's not the first time that anirudh is hearing this but i'm sure you must be hearing this for the first time all the audiences uh, that this book uh, should be explored by all of you and it's a request from our side that you must must get this book because again uh, <laughs> like all the young uh, writers who are coming up this book also has a 70 page kind of uh, bibliography and notes which i think is the most fun part you get to see so many uh, the small notes and books and everything and notes is followed by actually notes is about 60 pages and then there's a bibliography so you know uh, it always for people who are interested in historiography th- these are something that you must read there's so much in this book about the making of empires the sustenance of empires uh, the, the 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 cultural unity in some senses you know in the super stratum of the region and in, in terms of trans regional cultures and this intermingling and the beauty of uh, this nation's history uh away from that eurocentric away from that north centric approach of history this book really gives you a fresh perspective 
by young historians by young writers you know and i believe there were there there was a young research researcher also in his team while he was researching for the book uh, sarthak uh, from our friends uh, page so all these are going to develop this discipline of history which i think is 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 a is a must for considering our times and i must congratulate uh, anirudh for this and i believe that a, a platform like netflix or some uh, prime or any one would love to do a show based on this you know book there are so many uh, chapters especially the harsha's laughter where we didn't laugh at the end would really would interest a lot of people and harsha harsha ruled from very nearby from my place in kannauj i am in kanpur and he uh, was oh. the the center of his empire was kannauj so there is so much to explore in this book that uh, you know as he also said why are you going for those pseudo hoax or or you know fake history kind of videos which try to scandalize everything in the past and try to present you a fake narrative but rather go for these well researched books that are coming out especially i must congratulate team jagannath for picking up this manuscript and turning it into this beautiful a uh, book it's i think it's available on all the major bookstores across this nation i've seen pictures from bahari sons and uh, fakir chand in delhi and especially and also in universal bookstore in lucknow you all must get these book uh, this book from wherever you can get uh, either online and i think anirudh will be doing a book tour soon to different cities so you all can get those books signed as well and he will be back on caravan soon in, in a week or two so do join for those that that lecture uh, and thank you so much anirudh for taking out so much time to do this conversation is a truly an honor hosting you <laughs> my pleasure, my pleasure. thank right, you so much and good luck and yeah. enjoy the- yeah thank you Bye-bye. and i look forward to the date confirmation then we'll post the <laughs> poster online <laughs> Thank you. All right, take care. Bye bye. Yeah, bye bye, Anirudh. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining in. We will be back with another session uh, very soon. I think we have two sessions coming up. If you allow me, I'll just check the calendar and I'll post it. I think we have a session coming up on fifteenth of fifteenth of February. Um, it's on art, cinema, in India's forgotten future by Professor Rochana Majumdar. and then there's another session by uh, by professor goldman robert p goldman on dharm and dharmas ethical enquiries in mahabharata and ramayana the two big epics and mahakavyas and you know uh, that you i think you must watch and you must learn and if you are new to this channel uh, this page please do follow us uh, do follow anirudh's uh, instagram handle because he posts some wonderful stuff there and also some wonderful reels that he's coming up with follow jagannath's page and uh, they are coming up with some wonderful books um uh, in the past few years so do support uh, the publisher do support the author do support the bookstores get these books from your local bookstore support those bookstores and keep questioning with that thought thank you so much we'll meet again and till then uh keep reading keep questioning thank you